something I've been interested in uh, most of my adult life back during the peace movement and the anti-war or anti-nuclear movements. Uh, we, we used, a, you know, something probably akin or similar in consensus process. And uh, um, I, I always found it challenging because it it, it was it, 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 it took more involvement, but that it was so, so much more inclusive as a means to a group making decisions and moving forward together. And people who didn't necessarily get their way nonetheless did not feel so left out of the process and uh, that can really happen with majority rule so um, uh, I don't want to say much more than that I'm going to introduce our friends and let them um, take the microphone and lead us through so Jerry and Ted thank you so much we appreciate you being here well <clears throat> I am I am delighted to be here um, as I was telling Jeff just a little a bit ago, just, uh, you know, the circles of life go around. I first learned sociocracy about maybe 14 years ago from the Zen peacemakers. <laughs> from, uh, I went to a uh, workshop in uh, Bernie Glassman's uh, center in Montague, Massachusetts, which is only a little drive away from my home. Uh, and I was in a program there. I remember Frank the Val, the Val, uh, he was one of the folks who was uh, sharing sociocracy with us. I think there was some other folks, but I don't remember their names. Uh, and it was soon thereafter that I uh, met John Buck, who then I really more seriously learned sociocracy uh, with him and started teaching. Uh, so I'm really happy to be here back with, with this group. I've been a member of a, for, for a time, a member of a Sangha in my hometown in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, and I'd love, I'm going to do the introduction, but Ted, okay, later, um, never mind. Um, so I will go ahead and uh, say a few things about um, what we're talking about, sociocracy, and then Ted will take over and go through some slides, and uh, we're going to take turns going through a slide deck, uh, eventually stop for some Q&A and do an exercise together. That's kind of the plan. Uh, so ready for the first slide then and ted you want to the, the go around you'll do later or okay so what is uh what is sociocracy about um a peer governance system so we as equals govern ourselves uh, based on the principle of consent and there's kind of four major areas that we'll be talking about uh, so the basic organizational unit being the small group that we call a circle, uh, working together with a, with a clear purpose and having authority within their area of responsibility. Every circle is connected to other units um, by at least two people that are the links between them. And that helps with alignment, information flow and coordination of all the work. Third element, uh, decisions are all made by consent. Uh, and so the question is, do you consent or do you have any objection? And this is different at consensus. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and if there's any objections, then we work on it to see if we can turn the objection, the no into a yes and improve the proposal. And the last element is uh, feedback. Uh, we wanna be a growing organization, I mean, a, a continuous evolution through feedback. Uh, is kind of the thing that we say. Uh, so we are not set in stone with our policies, but we want to be able to continually learn and change, adapt to what we're to our in, uh, improved understandings of what's going on in our organizations and in the world. So those are the sort of the essential elements. Um, and I'll turn it to Ted to take the next piece. Hello, everybody. So yeah, that was the flyover. Let's go a little bit more deeply into that. And before we do that, I want to first take a step back and um, remind ourselves and each other of what's governance even, because typically governance, and that is what, what sociocracy is, right? It's a governance method. Typically people um, find governance abstract, which it is, and they think that that is something that is only needed in kind of... Um, um, big organizations or in governments and so on. And I want to bring governance 
back really to the people that do work together. So for me, what governance is, especially when we talk about self-governance, like in sociocracy, is it's what connects the people and the thing that we want to do. Because if you if you want to do a project with some complexity and you have 100 people wanting to do it together, it's not enough to just put 100 people into the room and say, let's do this, right? You will need some sort of process to figure out who is doing what. So in a way, a mechanistic but not wrong kind of way of looking at it is governance is kind of the plumbing between everything, right? It's like it's the wiring. It's what makes it all work. And as that, I would say it's very close to the people, right? Because it's the people that care about the same thing you care about. They want to work on the same thing. And the thing that you care about, like the project that you do together, and the governance system is what ties it all together. So it's very close to the people, actually. It's not something, something abstract and far away, quite the opposite. So something about the word, real quick, sociocracy. Um, and when we're in person, sometimes we just even practice saying it together, sociocracy. You know, the two parts of the, the word from different places, like sociocracy, like in uh, socio, like in sociology, right? Those who associate together and Chrissy, of course, like in democracy, um, governing, in this case, governing together. So a, a quick grasp of what sociocracy is is in the somewhat simplified version, but what I'd like saying is those who work together decide together. It comes from the Netherlands. It's been put together in the late 70s, early 80s, and has been used since and has really seen a big uptick in use in the last five or eight years. So it's, but we'll talk more about that in a bit at the end. Um, so those who decide together, that those who work together decide together. That's different from a hierarchical system, right? Because in a hierarchical system, those who do things, who work together at the bottom, and those who make the decisions are at the top. So it's not the people who work who make the decisions. It's their bosses, right? That's what a hierarchical system is. And in sociocracy, we try to put it both together again. So as Jerry was saying in the beginning, now again, a little bit more slowly, we start with the circle. That's kind of the, the cell that, that is like an autonomous, somewhat autonomous cell that is the beginning of everything. So those are the people who work together on something and they make the decisions about that something and they figure out how they want to go about it. Like for example, how long should our meeting be? How, when are we going to meet? How often do we meet? Who facilitates? Um, how do we take our notes? Like they really figure out how they want to work together. And how do we know what they're doing? Well, they have um, a defined aim. So that is the thing that they're trying to do, a description of what they're trying to do. For example, hosting events um, or hosting or no, running a meditation retreat. That would be an aim. And for that, they also have a domain, which is the thing that they can make decisions about. And again, so it's the, the thing that they do and the things that they decide together. So we try to give a circle an aim that a domain that empowers them to do the things that are in the aim. And I'm going to give you a little example of that now. Because the whole thing is kind of too obvious almost to grasp if it's just one team. Like, yeah, of course, they do things, they decide. What else, you know? But it gets a little bit more um, complex when we have more than one team. So let's use a simple example. Let's imagine that we have, let's say, a group of 30 or 40 people running a little gardening organization, like a community garden together. And I'm using gardening because everybody has a little bit of a sense of what that means, right? So let's say we have three teams. This is the team that is doing everything that has to do with plants. They do the planting, the harvesting, they order the seeds, okay? So these are the people with the green thumb. And then we have two other teams. This might be the team that is figuring out everything that has to do with the infrastructure, like the tools, the tool shed, the fences, the hoses. So those are not so much the green thumb people, these are more the builder people. And then these are the people people, let's call it people circle or something like that, or membership. 
they support the organization by um, like having a way for members to contact each other and to meet and know who's a member and inviting new people in and making sure people know about this organization. So membership, people, let's call it people circle. And now if you look at these three circles, everything that is done in the organization technically now has a place where it's done and where it's decided. So all the plant related decisions are made here, the membership and people related decisions are made here and the infrastructure related decisions are made here. So everything now has a place where it can be decided. Yet, it is also somewhat siloed now, right? Like how would they know what they're deciding? And that's why we take two people from each circle and put them into what we call the general circle. And you see, the general circle is not kind of separate. It is literally those two people. I want you to appreciate the, um, the photoshopping effort here, right? These are the same people. So, and that's important to me because it's not some kind of steering committee that bosses around the people here, but it's actually drawn from the people, right? It's, it's kind of an, an extension of the circles that meets in the general circle. And what do they do? Well, they make sure that there's information flow between the circles. They up here support like for example if everybody here is arguing the two of them will have a place where they can say hey can we have some support here because we don't know what to do in our group right now and and this is important they decide who decides if it's not clear so for example let's say these two circles argue for whatever reason of who gets to decide a particular thing they say oh it's clearly in our domain we should be deciding it and they say no no it's clearly in our domain we should be deciding it we need a place to, to resolve that, and that is here. So this circle always makes sure that everything continues to have a place where it can be decided. So they would not necessarily decide the thing, they would just make sure that it has a place. So it's a little bit like a meta group, right? They, they negotiate the, the aims and domains so that things can be decided. Tiny example on that one, let's say somebody, somebody approaches the general circle and says, why are we not doing any grant writing in the organization? We could write grants and get these $5,000 here and then do better gardening projects or give scholarships or whatever. Now, this question doesn't neatly fit into any of those um, domains yet. Well, let's imagine it doesn't. And then it comes to the general circle. The general circle would talk, okay, like who's going to do it? Is it going to be the plants people? Like oh, that seems to be a kind of far out from the plants stuff, right? Infrastructure, well, grants are somewhat infrastructure, but it is very different from the concrete physical things, right? So maybe it's people circle. Could they take on grant writing? And then in order to add grant writing to the aims and domains here, they would need to consent to that. Which means if one of them says, no, we're not willing to do that, it can't be dumped in, in, in their circle. So there's always mutual agreements to make sure that um, teams are really on equal, um, equal power with each other. So this circle cannot decide over that circle because it requires consent. And consent will go more into, but basically if one of them says, no, it's a, it requires more conversation. So that's the, that's the interesting piece that is not only balance of power between the individuals, but even between the groups. So that we have a place that negotiates where things are decided, but really they are free to decide on their own. And we have a way of resolving when something changes. And of course, the general circle to put grand writing somewhere could also form a fourth circle, right? That is just grand writing. If they can populate it, it's all good. If not, they'll have to figure something out. There is also what we call a mission circle, which is like an advisory board. And let's overlay this here. So while they are making sure everything can be decided and done, the mission circle looks more at the longer term planning, like what are we going to do in the context of climate change in our, in our um, gardening organization or how we can we make things more affordable longer term or whatever it might be like that kind of thinking that often doesn't have a place because we're so busy doing things is ideally here. And again, the same logic applies Two people from here 
are also decision makers here so that the, the long-term thinking is informed by the operations and can inform the operations and we have full flow of information between the two groups. Um, every team can also form sub-circles as they want to. For example, if this group, which was the hoses, irrigation tools and whatever, and they might say, hey, realistically, we have three people taking care of the tools and the tool shed. How about we just put that into the sub-circle? And they are now the final decision makers on the tools. So if they decide to throw out all the shovels that have plastic in them and replace them and they have the budget for it, they just get to decide that on their own. They don't have to ask anybody for permission if that decision is in their domain. So that way we can make fast decisions because we have a place for everything, right? And things can just get decided there without having to go to some central committee boss or whatever. So it's a very fast decision-making tool as soon as we know what's where. Inside a circle, we typically have those two people that connect the circles, one of them reporting one way, the other one reporting the other way, but I'm not gonna go too deeply into that right now. And then we have, just to make the circle run, uh, the role of the facilitator, so the person who manages the meetings and makes sure everybody can be heard and decisions move forward and so on. And then note-taking. It's also a very important part of the puzzle because in this decentralized system where stuff gets decided all over the place, it is um, a matter of transparency to have good meeting notes taken because, for example, if I'm in the plant circle but not in the people circle and they decide to change the membership fee, Right, they have the power to do that, but at least I want to read how they got to that decision. And ideally, there's also some feedback process around that, but at the very least, transparency. And then we might define operational roles like the person who counts the shovels after every workday, the person who does the bookkeeping, the person who shows around new members, like whatever it might be, we kind of put it in a role and then give it to a person and empower that person to do those recurring tasks so that we as a circle have time to think about more important things than just what happens all the time. Before I pass on to Jerry, I just want to highlight a little thing that's not so super important in practice, unless it, until it is actually, but it just shows you that spirit of sociocracy that I really very much appreciate. So let's look just for a moment at these linking roles here. So how, how, um, how these people are chosen very much determines the kind of culture we will have in this organization. Because let's say this person who would be called the delegate would be selected by this group. So they select one of them, one from among them to serve on the general circle. But the general circle also says, yes, we want to work with you. You are now a member of the general circle because nobody can be pushed onto the group, right? And then the other way, the leader is either selected here or here, but either way, the other circle also has to give their consent to that. So that way, it's not the people who scream the louders or how the, how the best at you know, giving, giving, um, giving speeches that sway a lot of people, but it's the people that are very trusted by the, by the people that they work with that end up in linking and in leadership positions. So it rewards a certain kind of behavior of being trusted by the people that, you, that actually have immediate um, experience with you. And that is one of the big things that makes it work really well because it rewards that behavior of being, um, being integrative of, of different opinions and um, trustworthy. And that leads to a pattern a little bit like this. And I really like that image it's from our work actually, um, where information just travels and travels because links just pass it on. Like the delegate reports back up and delegate reports up and then leaders report top down so that all the information ultimately can travel. It can of course also crisscross, but at the very least, everybody is kind of reporting somewhere so that information makes it through the system eventually. And this is our transition slide. I picked this um, I picked this picture because I love so much that it, to me, like I saw the picture and I thought, that's the vibe of a sociocratic meeting. Like that's it, that to me, that is it. That ex explains it better than all the words that I've said previously, that to me explains it. Because it's this, um, because we optimize both the structure and how the meetings run and how decisions are made for listening. 
and a better quality of listening, um, which brings us to rounds and decision making. Uh, unmute, Jerry. Okay. Yeah. So, how does a group, how does a circle function? You know, how do we listen in a circle? Uh, in any group, there's, you know, the often the prevailing form of conversation is what we call popcorn. People just speak up at will, or the facilitator calls on this person and that person. Uh, and when that happens, it's more likely to lead towards debate and argument. The, the basic, uh, I guess, technology, if you will, of sociocracy is the round, hearing from each person in turn so that every voice matters. Uh, so we'll just go around and person A will speak and so on. And there are many ways that we use rounds. When we present a proposal, we'll have a round to understand, you know, do we understand the proposal? Do you have any questions? Jeff, do you have any questions? No questions? Okay. Henry, how about you? And we just go around and hear from every person to make sure there's understanding of the proposal. Then we do the reaction round. What do you like about this? What don't you like about it? Often we say quick reaction round, five sentences or less. So we're not going to get into a long debate, but, oh, I like point one, two, and three. You know, oh, I have questions about point number four. You know, I have concerns there. Okay, thank you. And we do the consent round. Do you have an objection or do you consent to this proposal? So all of those rounds are supporting equivalence of everyone's voice. We also do rounds at the beginning of meetings of just Let's show up here. You know, how are you upon entering this meeting? What do you want to say so that you are present with us and we are present with you? And that might mean that you are suffering right now because a dear, a dear friend of yours has just died or that you are celebrating because you've just become a grandfather or you are tense about some item on the agenda. It could be any of those things, but we are showing up with each other. We do a round at the end of saying what went well, what could have been improved about this meeting. So again, that's the feedback place, but we hear from everybody. Ah, oh, this was a good meeting. We got a lot done. Um, I felt a little uneasy when, you know, so we share what actually, you know, our reactions to the meeting so that we can improve. Pass on. <clears throat> um, so the, if the decision-making in sociocracy is consent, that means, that we are all consenting to the decision. What are the other forms of decision making and what do they, how do they include or not include people? There is the form of decision making, which is the boss decides. So one or maybe a few people make the decision and everyone else carries it out. And then there is majority vote, where the 51% make the decision and there's winners and losers. Um, and then there is the consensus practice, which many of us, um, you know, learned from originally, uh, which is, do we all agree? Uh, and sometimes do we all agree is do we all agree minus one uh, or variations thereof to try to get through to a decision. What's effective about the boss deciding is that it gets done. You're like, I say so, go do it. Uh, but then we don't hear and we don't learn from the other, uh, from the voices and the experiences of others. Uh, and it doesn't feel very good to be just told what to do. Majority vote means that we're constantly struggling to win. The whole purpose <laughs> almost is, is, is winning. Living in the United States with the elections that we have, people often don't even pay attention to the issues. The news is, Who's ahead? Like it's a horse race. Oh, Biden is neck and neck with Trump. Oh, he's sticking ahead. Oh, you know, and that's that's the story is kind of who's going to win the race um, as if it was a sport, not something that's really meaningful to to where our lives in this world are going. And in consensus, the challenge is often just trying to get to that final point of making a decision. Um, where we might argue and argue and argue because we're not doing in rounds. We're not really supporting, as Ted said, that centrality of listening. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So what happens if, uh, you know, so we put our proposal and we, the question is, do you think this would work? And then we look at, 
or what comes up for us. Oh, I really like this proposal. That would be my preference from among different choices. Well, it's within my range of tolerance. It's not my favorite thing to do, but I think I could work with it. Or, hmm, I'm not sure this contributes to our aim, to the purpose of our group. And so in relationship to those reactions, we then have consent if, we, if it meets our preference or it meets our range of tolerance, this is good enough for now, safe enough to try. Or if we see that it might harm our aim, then it's our responsibility to object. And uh, when we, if we have an objection, then it becomes our responsibility to try to seek the resolution to it. So we have a circle, we have a proposal, we do a consent round, and we find one person with the thumbs down or saying, I object, and here's why. So then we want to understand the why of the objection so that we can, with that understanding of the why of the objection, then we can maybe do another round with the group is like, what do we do with this? How do we translate this objection into some amendment, some change that we can work with, that we can live with, so that we can take the next experiment of, you know, of taking the next step and learn from our activity. So there we seek to turn that, that objection into a, into a consent with those kind of modifications. And that's to you, Ted. Sure. So I've sort of already said that, but just for completeness, because it's one of the big parts. When we select the people who serve in roles, it ends on consent. And it's a very sweet process that I'm not going to go into right now of how we get there. Um, if you ever need a better way than um, voting to have somebody fill a role, um, look up the selection process. It's um, easy to do and really sweet. And it ends on consent. So as I said earlier, only the people who um, receive the consent from their peers in the circle end up in roles. Um, and if there's an objection, we learn from it, the same thing. So real quick, who uses sociocracy? As I said, it was um, only used in some areas uh, until maybe eight years ago. And then it has just increased um, over time with a few jumps. Um, but one area where it's traditionally been strong already before is in intentional communities. Like Jerry and myself, we live in an intentional community that uses sociocracy. So this is what this could look like, right? This, like Those circles often have different names depending on who names them because it's a free system and people just do what they do. So instead of general circle here, it's called coordinating circle. And then you see the different areas of activity of an intentional community, like the people and the buildings and the things that they um, uh, administer together, um, each have a circle here, and then the sub-circles and so on. This is a different community. You see, it's a very different style of drawing it, right? They're doing it with this um, bicycle metaphor, I think. But the idea is, again, the same thing. We have circles, double linked, right? With these two people going, going and being part of both circles. It's what they call the steering committee here, which is like a general circle and board kind of conflated, I think. And then the sub-circles and so on. So it's always the same principle of whatever the doing is of your organization, you put into circles and then you connect it all in the in the same way because that's just what an organization does, right? You have certain activities and they're connected. This is a nonprofit that teaches mindfulness that's sociocratic. It's a little blurry. I'm sorry about that. But you see, again, same idea. They have their main, main activities clustered into circles, a board, a general circle, double linked, and so on. What do we have here? A school. Schools have also, um, well, traditionally a place where sociocracy has been used, especially in Europe and Netherlands, um, because it has, you know, it has some strong um, footing there. This is a community organization in Canada that I worked with. So just to give you a little bit of um, variety of what kind of organizations use this. This is a co-op, so worker co-ops are also a, a good place for sociocracy because they need a governance system, of course, that gives just justice to everybody being a peer and being a co-owner um, in the organization. And this is our own organization. Jerry and I co-founded Sociocracy for All, which has about 190 or so people in 50-something circles. I haven't counted recently, but something like that. So again, you see the same pattern. I'm showing you that basically to show like what it looks like with several layers deep, right? So we're producing content and training, 
This is the general circle, internal support and membership. There's different languages, different ecosystems where people use sociocracy, like co-ops and schools and potential communities that I already mentioned are connected by a general circle and a mission circle for long-term planning. And then all the branching off of different activities that need more focused effort and more focused um, decision-making. Let's see, Ooh, what is this now? Oh yeah, this is a software company, but that's also just more as a fun fact here that also um, there are some for-profits, of course, that use sociocracy. We are ourselves a training organization. So if you're interested in training, there's all kinds of different strands that we offer um, decision-making that will, will be is somewhat similar to what we'll do in our second part of today. Meetings, building structure and um, accountability is an important topic because sometimes people struggle to see how we can hold each other accountable if we're peers, right? Without a boss who says, hey, I thought you'd be done by now with this project. Isn't that what you said? And they, so that has, um, needs a lot of relearning and unlearning of what people's, um, yeah, people's experiences and, and strategies are. Their books, Chair and I wrote this, I wrote that. Our colleague wrote this for children. So that's a fun, fun involvement that um, now there's a whole branch looking at how to use sociocracy with six to 12 year olds and teenagers. So that's really fun because they pick it up very easily not as many decades of unlearning for children as for us grown-ups. And detail yeah. before you move out of that, Ted, you know, Many Voices, One Song is kind of the, the manual, the detailed how-to, and who decides who decides is uh, particularly useful for startup groups. It, it outlines kind of the first three meetings and how you should focus on the first three meetings of aim, who decides, and how do you decide. <clears throat> So that you get off to a good start. Yes. And I think, what are we doing, Jerry? Are we pausing for questions and then going into practice? Maybe. I don't know. You, I, you, you take over from here. You decide. Um, well, I just, let's see. I don't know how many people we've now got. Yeah, we're still a small group. I would say let's go into practice. Of course, now I can't see the slide. Um, what was our issue? Oh, I had the seeing the video, right? Yes, I'll, I'll so, pull it up, yes, I'll pull it up, sorry. Yes, I will. One thing we didn't um, talk that much about is, you know, what happens in a meeting. Um, so the first, the, the opening of a meeting is, is what we mentioned before, the opening round, just how are you showing up together? Then usually comes the admin part, the administrative part of attendance, um, what's the duration of the meeting? Uh, do we have to say anything about the minutes from the last meeting? Information announcements, and are we clear when our next meeting is going to be? So that's kind of administrative things to make sure that this, you know, the business of our of our, our structure of our meeting is taken care of. Then comes in a very important part, which is the consent to the agenda. You know, here's what the people who have planned the agenda have come up with, and uh, do we like it? Um, do we, you know, are we okay with it? Do we want to make some changes in it? And then the next part is what we call just a, the backlog, updating the backlog. Is there anything that we haven't dealt with uh, that we need to make sure we put it on the list for future meetings? And then we do the closing round. So how was this meeting? So in the body of the meeting itself, you know, the items, uh, we think of their main, there are kind of three different kinds of things rounds what we want to understand there is issues that we want to understand and explore and there are decisions that we want to understand explore and decide so those are the kind of the three items so we wanted to give you practice with one simple item um, and it is then the uh, here's the 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 aim of our group and so everybody who's present right now uh, let's say that you're in this circle um, and the aim of the circle is experiencing tools and practices from sociocracy. And the proposal that we want to make to you is for, the, for this webinar session, everyone keeps their camera on. Okay. And that's just an example to have an example. Yeah. You don't have to panic if you wanted to turn your camera off just now. So. So that's the proposal. The aim is experiencing tools and practices from sociocracy. 
and the proposal is that for this webinar session, everyone keeps their camera on. Okay, so now uh, I'm gonna make sure I can see everybody. And we would ask, uh, the first question is, do you understand the proposal? Do you have any questions? And so I would go around. Now for simple, for simple proposals, I would just say, any questions? Hearing none, move on. Uh, for more complicated more proposals, I would say, okay, let's do a round, see if there's any questions. Jeff, do you have any questions? And Jeff would say, no. And then I go, Henry, do you have any questions about this proposal? Do you feel like you understand what it says? This is, this is, I'm playing this for real. So Henry, do you have okay. any questions? Yes, yeah. <laughs> I do. You have a question? No. No questions. Okay. And I could go to Carolyn. Any questions? Nope. And you can all unmute for this part. And Kathleen? Um, do I get it right that the proposal is to keep the camera on? And I, my question is why? The question is why? Mm -hmm. uh, good question. The, the, the purpose of keeping the cameras on uh, would be that uh, if we want to experience the tools and practices from sociocracy, it's easier to do that when we can see each other and connect with each other. Mm. So being visually present would support the learning. So I have a question. So when you're doing a round like that and people ask questions, uh, are you it, who are you going to just keep going around and just there are a, a group of raised questions or are you going to interject like you just did and answer yeah. the question good good question <laughs> so in terms of process there are two different ways to do it one is to go all the way around and collect all the questions the other way is to ask answer the questions one by one as they come up if it's something simple, I assume that this is a fairly simple proposal and that there would probably be no questions or that the questions would be very easy to answer. And therefore I was choosing to do them one by one if they came up. In a more complicated or maybe more controversial issue, I would collect all the questions first so that I wouldn't, you know, what we wouldn't want to have happen is to break the round like we are just doing right now. <laughs> so Where I get into a long conversation with Kathleen about her issue or with Carolyn about the process. But isn't it, so who, 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 who designated you as the question answerer? It seems like a power thing. Well, the question answerer is either the facilitator who's running the meeting that you selected by consent, Hi. or it could be the person who wrote up the proposal to begin with, okay. brought it to the group. They're just the author of the proposal. So Chloe, do you have any questions? about this proposal? Nope. Okay, then, um, and I'll, I'll skip Ted in this part. So, right, so, okay, now we do a round on what do you like or don't like about this proposal? Quick reaction, just a few sentences or fewer than a few sentences. So I go to, and I can change the order. So I could go to Carolyn first and then Kathleen. Do you like this proposal or is there something you don't like about it? Or are you concerned about it? Uh it's fine with me. Mm -hmm. Kathleen and then Jeff. Yes, I, I also like it, uh, especially as you answered uh, my question, because in the virtual space, I also think that seeing each other is at least some kind of connection. Yes, so I like it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what did I say? Jeff, I think. Jeff and then Chloe. I like, I like it very much. Um, uh, if we were in physical proximity in a meeting, it's impossible to become invisible. So <laughs> I, think this, I think this enhances intimacy. So I like it very much. Mm -hmm. Chloe and then Henry. I think it's a good idea. Um, one thing that comes up is there are people who are shy who might not want to have their camera on. But I think for the in this situation, um, it's best for everyone to have their camera on. Mm -hmm. And Henry. I think not only is it a good idea, but it should be done as much as possible uh, to keep the kind of social connections that really this program depends on. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we've finished the reaction round and then I could go to the consent round. And in this case, I might just say to save time, you know, I mean, when it's, when it's a 
when it's a challenging proposal, I might want to hear everyone's voice and say, I consent or I have no objections. If it's something fairly simple, I might just say, give me your thumbs, you know, thumbs up if you consent, thumbs down if you object. And if you do sideways, that means you still need some time to talk, talk something through. So show me your thumbs. If you consent, show thumbs up. And if you've got a different reaction. So did I see everybody's thumb? I didn't see Henry's thumb. It's there. Okay. All right. So yay, we made a decision. We consented. <clears throat> Now, interestingly, most of the time when we do this, we do not get consent to this sample proposal. <clears throat> I can object. I can object. <laughs> so, Ted, what would be a typical thing that people would say? Oh, a typical thing as well. What if somebody um, doesn't have enough bandwidth, and if we force them to turn their camera on, that means they can't hear because it'll break their bandwidth, and that means they miss everything. Oh. And the I let me just kind of play two roles at once. So that would be the objective position. And my commentary on it is that the way I phrase the objection, I already kind of presented you a clean objection, like it's a really useful objection because I was already referring to the aim, right? So hold on. If we do this, then given that some people don't have the perfect or the optimal bandwidth, that means they miss out on practice and experience. <clears throat> Right. It's not I don't like this because it's a stupid proposal or I don't think we should do this because the sun isn't shining today. Right. But there's an actual reason. And I can point exactly in the aim to what it is that our proposal tangentially kind of negatively interferes with. So. One another little comment is that sometimes people talk about this in the hypothetical, right? If we make a decision for us and nobody had bandwidth issue, I would say, OK, but it, like. Is it something that is kind of real here right now? Um, but it is, it is a, of course, a good example for an objection. So back to Jerry, what would you do with it? <laughs> what would I do with it? What would we do with an objection with like that? Okay, so then we could do a round. You know, then there may be some other reasons, you know, like some people like are shy about eating in front of others. And it's like, oh, I'm in the middle of eating. This is the only way I could show up at this meeting. I'm a little embarrassed about eating in front of you. And we could say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. But you know, it might say, well, I'm eating. Or uh, it might be that there's a lot of distraction in the background. They're at a cafe and people are walking back and forth. Or, you know, you've done enough Zoom meetings perhaps that you've seen, I don't know, I've seen several naked people walk behind somebody <laughs> across the screen because it's somebody's house, right? We're all in our homes now most of the time. And so it might be some cases where for, for various reasons, people might want to have uh, the choice of having their screens off. And so what would we do if there were some concerns and objections? We would do around. You know? because the objections belong to all of us, not just a person who's raising the objection. So why do we, you know, given what we're hearing about people's concerns, um, what's your reaction to the concerns that you've heard raised about, you know, everyone keeping their camera on for the whole program? So, and then I do around. So Chloe, what do you have? Do you have a re what do you what do you respond to the objections and the concerns that you've heard about this proposal? Well, um, I have a quick question. Um, in your experience with this process, does it ever seem like things take forever? Because it's like we're asking people, I don't know. I'm not able to like articulate yeah. this very well, but anyway, that was a let's, let's, uh, let me hold that question for a moment. Okay. Let's just stay with the, with the little process of any okay. reflections you have on hearing the objections uh, or concerns that people had about keeping their cameras on. What would you um, do with that? How would we turn yeah, this into I, a, how could we amend this proposal? If we, you know. Um, I think that um, those are valid reasons why someone uh, might want to keep their camera on. Um, I think one thing you could say is that we strongly encourage people to keep their camera on because of this and this reason. And then possibly people could give a reason why their camera is off. And so that would help 
people feel that that they were being included in this decision to keep your camera off. Mm -hmm. Okay, Henry, and then Kathleen, your reaction uh, to. Uh, well, I, I made a strong uh, agreement that it's very helpful from the social forming of the group to have the camera. Uh, so I'm not sure what question you're asking me. My my reaction is uh, that if we want to continue the group, we're going to have to make an adjustment to fit the needs of a particular person, perhaps, uh, and to the best we can. Mm -hmm. So uh, as Ted started writing their uh, amendment uh, to rather than require it, to recommend it, but yeah. let it be optional, let the individual make a judgment call whether they're going to be on or not. Uh, but clearly we're saying we would love for you to have it on so because it would support our learning. That's um, right. So you would support that amendment in that way. I, I would, well, well worded. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Kathleen and then Jeff. Yeah. When I was listening to the objections, I, I found that I was uh, reacting to the proposal with some, uh, yeah, how do you say, it? preoccupation maybe. And that is that it is already clear that this circle or this meeting is somehow embedded, that it's not from zero. And so that there's a possibility to take care in advance of the meeting um, that this proposal can be fulfilled. So, so I felt that there's some, I felt some responsibility to, if I put up such a proposal for a meeting, I can ask in advance, is it possible for everyone? How can we support you? Can you take care of having your camera on? Because this, this might be or will be the proposal for this meeting. Can you do something about it? Can you um, yeah, kind of prepare for this? Or can we help you? Can the circle support you in reaching that goal or, or fulfilling this proposal? So um, this was my uh, thinking that th that would at least raise the, um, the percentage of people uh, joining that, that can, can have and will have their camera on. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if it started at a later time, but announce ahead of time that this is how we would yeah. like to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and if there's any help that we can give to anybody so that they can be present with their cameras on. Did I understand you, Kathleen? Right, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ahead. And Carolyn? Or did I skip to you? So, I can't remember um, now, I've, the circles move around, so I don't remember if I was calling them. Anyway, Carolyn, go ahead. So I've actually um, been in meetings where this has become uh, is an, an issue, and um for people who don't have good bandwidth um uh the suggestion has been made uh that you know <laughs> can't you do something to increase your bandwidth change your your subscriber uh surprise you know uh pay for more um uh more bandwidth etc but it's turned out that um Lots of times, uh, other um, options aren't available in their particular location, right. uh, and of course, there's an increased cost. So, who's going to bear that cost? Is the group saying, "Well, we'll pay for you to have increased bandwidth so you can turn your camera on"? Um, and generally, the answer to that is no. And so, uh, we have had to, to let people turn their camera off because we want to hear from them. And that has been the way it's, it's kind of, we've had to settle less than optimal, but um, the only realistic way to make it, um, to make it happen. And I think it's also potentially a, an equity issue. If I say, you know, I have perfectly good bandwidth, you know, and, and, and I say, well, you should pay more for more bandwidth <laughs> is, is kind of a, an obnoxious uh, uh, proposal on my, you know, as, assumption on my part that the person can afford it, et cetera. So I think the idea of, um, you know, make optional, but recommended is a. 
Mm -hmm. right. So participation is better than not participation. <laughs> That's what part of line in a sense. Uh, Jeff, did I skip you in the round uh, so far? It, yes, but it's okay. Um, I, I think my proposal would be just slightly more strident. Uh, it would be for the webinar session. Everyone, please keep your camera on unless you're limited by technology. Um, so that, you know, so that uh, the, the one amendment, uh, make optionable but recommended, that still leaves it, well, you know, thank you for the recommendation, but I'm not comfortable, even though my technology would support me doing that. Uh, I would prefer not to have that be an, uh, an, an option and that, that technology would be, you know, the, the, the one reason not to have your camera on, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so then if I'm facilitating the meeting, I might take this and go, okay, uh, let's, there, there's actually, here's, here's an interesting little dilemma here. There are, uh, there are two, two different proposals in a sense coming out of what people have said. One is to make it optional, but recommended. And there's a couple of additions to that of, you know, pre prepare ahead of time, support people as best we can. Um, so optional, but recommended versus um, optional only for technical reasons. <laughs> um, and so at this point, I might either do two things. One is, okay, let's do a round on the optional, but recommended versus optional uh, only for technical reasons and hear what each person says. And then having heard that, then I would say, okay, I'm gonna make a proposed amendment here and see if we have consent or not and go through the process. But I don't wanna get it, you know, I'm doing a round of, I, you know, what I just said is I would do a round of that reaction to which way to go just to hear what everybody says. Cause then when everybody's spoken, then Jeff might say, well, having heard everybody else, uh, I still want people to do it, but I'll withdraw my objection. Or everybody else might go, oh, you know, what, what Jeff said makes a lot of sense to me. So I want to, I really support that. And so I, I, as facilitator, hearing what I'm hearing in the round, will then come back and make a proposal. And there we are again. Are we sure we understand it? Uh, and can we now consent to it? Um, and that is kind of the basic decision-making process, rounds, rounds, rounds. Now, um, so now we can take some time for just Q&A from anything that we've said. Um, I'll, maybe I'll just start with Chloe's question of, uh, doesn't this, this sounds like it would take a really long time. Um, and, you know, we are picking a very small issue here, but as, as Carolyn said, you know, this has come up, it does come up in meetings. Um, in a sense, two things I want to say is speed comes with practice. So you just, you mm -hmm. just do rounds really quickly because you're used to it and you know each other. Here, we don't know each other necessarily. Um, and the other is what's the short-term cost versus the long-term cost? You know, the fastest way to make a decision is because I said so. We want that kind of efficiency. You know, sometimes it's kind of nice to have the boss just say so. And it's like, we're relieved, we just move on, you know, like, uh, and there are some cases where that's useful because we don't want to spend the time discussing that. Let's just delegate that authority to somebody to make happen, you know, cooking, you know, you, you know, we are all the cooks, but Jeff decides when the, when the meal, when the, when it, when it's tasty enough to serve. We're not going to have a consent decision-making among all of us whether this has enough or too much salt. Jeff might ask for our opinions, but we're delegating to Jeff, you make the decision. Because otherwise the food will be cold by the time, you know, it gets served because we're taking 20 minutes to decide whether it's tasty enough right now. <laughs> so it depends upon the context. Um, let's see, did I answer that? Oh, anyway, I think that's my, my first answer. Um, and I don't know, Ted, if you want to add anything to that. I always want to add. Um... Yeah, I guess also I, just building on what Jerry said, there is this um, there is a concept that I would just want to introduce here, and that is, is basically Jerry said it, but I'm going to say it in my own words. So the operational decisions, right? Of it, does this food have enough salt? You know, like what are we going to do right now about this and so on? And then there are general decisions. 
like for example how do we generally go about membership who generally takes care of this and that and what we're trying to do in this whole system is we're trying to kind of build the scaffolding of everything so that we always know who decide like who's in charge of what you know like how do we generally go about this and that so that we don't end up in a situation where um, we have to talk about every little thing that we do, right? So that scaffolding or the basic guidelines and the basic who does what and what belongs into whose um, authority, that we set in place by consent because that's worth talking about. And then ideally everything is already clear that people just then can base their operational decisions on that. And that takes a little bit of practice of figuring out kind of what is a good idea to make a general guideline about or clustering it into a role and so on. And what, um, yeah, when is it worth putting in the effort of, of creating that guideline and when do you just wing something? So that's um, also a matter of style, right? Sociocracy can be used in a everybody decides everything together kind of way or in a very agile and nimble way where we cluster things more and assign them. And both of them are sociocracy, right? It's kind of the building blocks to do either or something in the middle, whatever fits your needs the best. Okay. And maybe one more comment is compared to what? You know, the boss compared to majority rule, where the majority decides this way this year and that way next year because a different majority is in place. You know, we in the United States are completely kind of stuck with an almost equal division of powers between two parties that control everything. Um, and it just, on one person's vote, it just keeps shifting. And so, what one house builds, the other house tears down, and then the next house builds it up again, and the next house tears it down, and we don't make progress. So other questions or reflections? It doesn't have to be questions. It can just, you can basically say things that, oh, I like hearing this or that. So any insight? I have a question. Your questions, Henry. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, back in my history, uh, I have some similar experience because I was a Quaker. And uh, not exactly in the way you've organized it, but a lot of that approach to how people share decision-making is, uh, is in that. Maybe uh, I'm gonna go back into my memory and when I was a clerk of a meeting, in other words, a facilitator, and uh, see what, <laughs> comparing that with what you brought up. But I have a specific question about the process. Uh, when you first talked about the, the general uh, committee or circle with two people from each of the outer circles coming together to get things organized, the first thing that occurred to me is that those are two people who are going to be, uh, how should I put this, either sent by or at least intent and likely to think about how they could defend their circle's decision. <laughs> as opposed to uh, being happy to talk about going around and everybody agreeing on something. So I'm just wondering if you, with your experience, has anybody bumped into that problem of, of, of colleagues or representatives in this case, uh, defending a position uh, in the face of other disagreements uh, from the general group? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, and I do want to say that uh, the whole, the, the origins of sociocracy are in a Quaker school in the Netherlands. Okay. Um, and so that's what the teachers and the students work together to decide what and how they would learn. And one of the students who went to that school was a man named Gerard Endenberg. He went on to become an electrical engineer and then brought sociocracy to, the, to a company there. And that's where he finished sort of def defining what we now know as sociocracy. So Quaker roots is very, very core. Uh, you know, every voice matters. There is that of God in everyone, as the Quakers would say. Yeah, yeah. The selection process of leaders and delegates, which means those people serve in two circles, kind of what one might call their home circle, and their parent circle. Um, one of the bases of selections is we want people who are able to do both things, think about the whole, and think about our own particular group's needs and, and functions. So you want, you want to select people who are able to hold that kind of context of like, 
defend your circle's work when it needs defending, let it go. Uh, when you hear the needs of the whole, and it's like, you yeah, know, it's time to let sort of our attachment to this let go because in the interest of the whole. So that's part of, for me, that's what the selection process brings out is people who are able to do both, you know, be multi-partial, if you will. Okay, does, it, does it happen that those two terrific delegates that you've selected uh, are in a situation where they have to come back to the original circle uh, to share it and see what reaction they get if there's a sticky problem? In it depends. I mean, each circle is responsible for its own area of decision making. Right. So if you know, if you and I, Henry, were leader and delegate, but we were serving in the parent circle, we're we're making decisions by consent with whatever is in our domain there, and we have the authority to make those decisions. Oh, okay. Thank you. You can always change in what domain an issue is. Let's bring this issue into that circle's domain or this issue into that circle's domain. But we have been entrusted with making decisions at this level. And if we mess up too many times, then our circle might say, you know what? I think we need a different leader than Jerry. <laughs> Somebody else <laughs> needs to be here because he's not really holding up his, you know, sort of understanding or uh, clearly presenting what we need in our circle. And so we need somebody else there. That's okay. That's part of the process. Leadership is selected by consent. Mm -hmm. And the, but the other piece that you said, or, or, or something else I want to say to what you're bringing up is that when we distribute authority to smaller groups to make decisions that impact others, with that then comes the responsibility to get feedback. So if we're going, if our circle is going to change the membership policy, you know, the six of us are going to change the membership policy that affects the thousand of us, then, wow, that's a pretty big decision. And, you know, so we want to get appropriate level of feedback. It means we might do a survey, we might do some interviews, um, we might put out to the community, here's what we're thinking of doing. What do you think of what we're thinking of doing? Give us some feedback. Thank you for the feedback. We're still going to make, we are still have the authority to make the decision, but we're going to do it based upon feedback. And I have experienced this as an interesting dynamic when, um, when a community that I trained made a, um, as soon as they adopted sociocracy, they went ahead and one of the circles who was responsible for the community building for the uses of the rooms, they made an immediate decision to change one of the rooms from a kid's playroom to an arts and crafts room. The next day, people came into that space and went, what? What? You could just do that? Oh, I don't like sociocracy if you could just do that. <laughs> um, and that was fair feedback because yeah. the group had done no, no, no talking with the community about something as significant as changing a room in the common house. And the feedback was simple. They were mostly an aging community. They didn't have kids. And they wanted to be multi-generational. So taking away the kids' room meant that any visitor would see that there was no space for kids. It was mm -hmm. less inviting. So having a place for kids was a signal of invitation um, to anybody who was going to visit and consider living there, as well as a place to play with your grandchildren if you didn't have you know, uh, kids. So. So that was a, a really significant lesson learned for that community. But they had to struggle for months and months afterwards of all the fallout from that, from the trust issues that came up with that. The alternative story would be in, in our own community, when we first adopted sociocracy, we, we worked with the issue of outdoor cats, which had been the most painful issue for the previous 18 years. <laughs> because what are outdoor cats? They're, they're natural, they belong outside. What are outdoor cats? They're bird killers, you know? <laughs> uh, and so tension, there was a lot of tension between the two different camps in our community and no way to resolve that. So we did what I was just saying to you, Henry, we did surveys, we did interviews, we came up with a plan that I would say many people were not happy with because it, you know, there were too many cats, not enough cats. <laughs> Um, but everybody was thrilled 
that we came up with a plan that people could work with. It was okay. We could live with it. And it laid to rest this painful issue. And we haven't had any pain about this issue for the last nine years. Good. So that's the contrast. You know, when you have a responsibility, how do you use it, you know, in a way that earns trust rather than loses trust? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Jerry and Ted, um, I have a question. Um, uh, if for, you know, 30 or more years, I spent my working life in fairly traditional corporate structures. And, um, and those, you know, 100% of the time, uh, there is a person, if not a whole bunch of people who are hired and paid and, and they earn bonuses or they don't earn bonuses. They get fired or they don't get fired based on performance that's perceived to be 100% their responsibility. Uh, among the organizations I was parts of, I saw um, narcissism, nihilism, corruption, <laughs> ignorance, and once or twice in 30 some years, a flash of, of enlightened leadership that was not sociocracy, but was acknowledging that the woman, let's say, who was the CEO, ultimately, as we say, the buck stopped with her. And ultimately, at the end of the conversation, she was going to make the decision. But that building up to it was a high, I won't, I won't say it was as coordinated or, or lovely as what you've described, but a very committed participatory process where you know she really wanted to hear from everybody and really and you could really see her shift perhaps what her original direction was before it went to the group based on what the group said somebody who's really willing to you know to you know to be influenced by the group i think lincoln might have been famous for this um do you have any comments on how that and i guess we might call that a hybrid of some sort it, it is not the group making the decision, but but at its best, it's it's an informed level of participatory decision making. Any 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 words about whether that's wise or effective or or not? Well, um, if I translated it into a sociocratic environment, what you're talking about, basically what we have is we have a role that has, a, where let's say we decided together to put a lot of authority into that person. You know, there is leadership in sociocracy, right? The circle has a leader. So for example, I in our organization serve currently as the leader of the general circle, which makes me the counterpart of the executive director, like your counterpart, right? Um, and that does come not necessarily with I don't want to call it power, though the, there is a power in it, but it's not kind of the power to undo things that other circles have done, right? But it does come with leadership, with weaving things, sending impulses into the organization and so on. So it kind of changes a little bit of, but back to your example, um, what happens from a sociocratic point of view, we cluster a lot of power and consent to a person serving in that role and that person then makes decisions with feedback right so the only it, one could in theory cluster a lot of power into one role the one difference is that it would still be by consent that that person would be chosen and on a term but one can really as i said earlier one can push it in a very horizontal way where basically all decisions are made in a group or one can push it into a more uh, individualistic version where one clusters things into roles and gives a lot of uh, responsibility there. So to me, that's really almost like a dial that one can push closer in that direction or in that direction, and it's both compatible. Um, ultimately, I guess what your story underlines is what Jerry was saying, right? Any kind of decision, whether it's a group decision or an individual decision, really is um, is a better decision and gets more buy-in and just has a richer basis basis to stand on if there has been a more more feedback and more getting feedback. So I guess that is maybe the hybrid that you're looking for of can one, even if empowered, let's say unilaterally empowered and not put into that role by consent, 
um, can one still act as if one is basically depending on the other people's consent and just um, just run that way uh, without having been nominally that way? I guess that's possible. The only one thing is that I always worry about that because some people kind of do it like that. For example, if you have a for-profit running this way, right, where ultimately one person owns the thing, you know, like how much power can you share when ultimately that's all a pretend game because one person has the power legally, normally, like, and that's just hard to ignore, you know, because also another thing that I want to bring up there is we all carry some pain around having been in these situations where we were told we had power when we didn't, you know? So when we were kind of, you know, every child knows what that feels like when the teacher says, oh, you know, like all your input is welcome and then it isn't, you know? So we all have an experience of that. So it is actually very, very damaging for people's sense of hope when we pretend that there is a participatory mm -hmm. process when there isn't them or when it gets overwritten. So that's, there's a lot of things kind of to consider there. One can almost make it worse or one can, or it can work well, you know? So it's a little bit of a gamble. Yeah, but great answer. Thank you, Ted, thank you. Yeah, just, you know, the benign dictator, you know, better than a tyrant, but it does not develop, you know, as I think as Ted was saying, does not spread and develop leadership. And in one of our particular stories, we had a, there was a Waldorf High School that was operating sociocratically. Um, the head of school was totally in support and supporting making it happen. Uh, she left and the board of directors who had not been really fully trained in sociocracy hired a new director. The new director walked in, said, what's this? You know, I want command and control. <laughs> and that's it. That was the end of sociocracy in that school because it went back to hopefully a benign dictatorship or worse, who knows. Uh, Kathleen, saw your hand up. Yeah, Gloria, thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this all, of course, this all reminds me also of, of these terms of servant leadership and be the full organization and I really appreciate that direction and still the structural uh, power of structural violence as people even say, um, yeah, you can't ignore it, it's a big tension. And that also leads to one of my questions to you. So what is the greatest challenge or biggest challenge or obstacle or yeah, something that, that makes you really hard, that makes the work really hard for you with your clients, if there's something like that. And the other question is, because I was happy when, when Jerry, when you said in the very beginning that you basically met sociocracy with the Zen peacemakers and uh, I have been in touch before because I'm so close to the Netherlands here and I heard about um, uh, Endenburg and so on uh, and met those people early, um, 20 years ago or something. But then I was really delighted when I also found uh, this tool, this wonderful tool with the Zen Peacemakers and was introduced also into a decision a sociocratic decision making in the Zen Peacemaker circles and so on. And so we trained that. Uh, and still, I'm wondering, um, have you, do you also have um, the spiritual groups or traditions as clients? Because power is something very special in, in spiritual um, communities and organizations, I sense uh, or I experience somehow. So I'm, I appreciate so much that the peacemakers try on this, and I wonder, but that's my, more a question to Jeff, uh, maybe in another place, if the peacemakers are still kind of training in sociocracy or keeping it up. That's a different thing. But the question to you is, do you have experience in the spiritual field as well? And what is your greatest challenge in your work? Thank you. That's, um, I'll do it in the order. So the main obstacles, I jotted them down here. Um, first, people's pain. Pa the fact that, that we get kind of people, you know, not just we, but the fact that most people have so much pain and trauma around power. And that is, there's just, that's why I made that side comment about sociocracy with kids being easier because there's fewer decades of unlearning to do. You know, they just look at it, like young people look at them and go like, oh, that makes sense, let's do that, you know. 
and there isn't uh, there's just so much that we even experience you know in our own organization with people like I remember a story where I was going into full freak out mode because I projected power over into a group you know it's like and it just it just so close to the surface it's just so close and people's I guess you know I guess sometimes there's learned self um what is that learned helplessness no, you know what I mean. Is that the word? Anyway, but just um, people not being used to having co-responsibility and trying to wiggle their way out of it and all of those behaviors that come up just because of trauma, basically. So that's a huge issue. Um, the other one is also what we touched on legal things, you know, like the legal and ownership interface. Mm -hmm. um, if, for example, legal systems really like centralization of power because it makes it easy to say who's responsible, right? And it's hard to manage that. Like, how do you plug a sociocratic system into the system out there in the world that wants one person to be responsible? And then the other one is just bandwidth resources, people trying to do it without being fully trained, without really having transitioned their mindset and kind of use it. Yeah, so that's that sometimes creates issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those are my big three. What would you add, Jerry? Anything? Yeah, no, I, I think I just wrote down humans. <laughs> <laughs> humans are a big problem. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and the 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 um there, there, there's several things that then I want to say to that. Um that is that it is, you know, we the way we teach sociocracy and we want from sociocracy is that people get not just the mechanics of like, oh, we're going to go around. Like, well, why are we going around? We're going around because every voice matters, because we are all interconnected. So it's that constant kind of drip, kind of in a sense of, of consciousness about why we do what we do, mm -hmm. that it is about interconnection, uh, interdependency. We... Um, one of the things that we've brought in a lot in our in our work with sociocracy is nonviolent communication. Um, and I see a couple of heads nodding. Not everybody's familiar with that, but it's just another, uh, uh, you know, when I say humans are the problem, then it becomes really important to skill development in how we communicate with each other, how we understand ourselves, how we develop our empathy, you know, for others and, and for what for our own reactions. And then that's just critical to the high quality. Uh, of communications that we need in our decision making. So we support and promote nonviolent communication a lot. Uh, and there's other methods that are all in there as well. Uh, and in the context of supporting nonviolent communication, we always talk some about mindfulness. <laughs> um, but we don't, we, we, haven't, uh, we haven't had a way to, to like directly sort of push that, if you will. <laughs> um, but that's, yeah, I guess that's the, it, it's, I, one of the things that I, whenever I do trainings, this one accepted, I guess, I always start with, with Gandhi. And I talk about Gandhi, the, the three, the threefold uh, framework of social change, which is the challenge program, saying no to that which hurts people, the constructive program, saying yes to building now, the kind of world we want, and sociocracy is part of the constructive program, uh, how do we want to see governance? And then the third element for Gandhi, the most important one was spiritual purification, mm -hmm. is how do we work on ourselves so that we can be you know, as effective as possible working with our allies or working with the people who are, you know, who we see as, you know, triggering more damage in the world mm -hmm. um, so that we are coming from the place of care and love and not from a place of blame. Uh, so working on ourselves. And to me, that's the place, uh, again, of you know that I also learned from Zen peacemakers and and from Buddhist Buddhism in general and from Quakers uh, around you know, that that deep spiritual understanding of how we are all interconnected. The one of the, the quotes in uh, nonviolent communication that I always share is from Rumi: um, "Out beyond right doing and wrong doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there." Um, so that's the, the place to, you know, how can we meet in that place? Um, Ted's asking about working with spiritual organizations, which is a different question than how do we embody spiritual understanding within our work. 
which is interesting because just um, just before this call, uh, I was doing a little consulting work with a group called Jesus People. Uh, they have a building with 150 people in the city of Chicago, and they're considering adopting sociocracy. Uh, so it is it is kind of interesting to to see when Ted earlier talked about ecosystems. You know, how is sociocracy spreading among Unitarians? Because Unitarians are very, you know, with their perspective, they're very friendly to sociocracy. I would expect, you know, Zen peacemakers and all the Buddhist groups to, you know, also be friendly. Um, you know, we also have lineage and, you know, top-down traditions that also negotiate with that. Um, but yeah, so it's interesting to work with with the variety of groups. I've, I've worked with some um, um, Jewish, Jewish, ba Jewish based faith based groups. So there are for every religion or spiritual approach, there is a set of people that are kind of open to that, you know, that the mystical sides of all the religions as opposed to the fundamentalist sides. So I'll stop Thank there. you for the rich, for your good answers. As you said, good question, good answer, I say. Thank you. <laughs> No, I'm, Jerry, I'm, I'm glad you, I'm sorry, Chloe, go ahead. You actually raised your hand and I just started talking. So <laughs> go ahead, Chloe. Um, do you have any suggestions, um, like just uh, for on an individual level, let's say you find yourself in a system and um, the power structure is not open to things like nonviolent communication, not very much open. Um, to these, to sociocracy. Um, what are things as an individual we can do in terms of our relationship? How do we hold integrity if we choose to stay in a system that, you know, is, you know, there's some narcissism happening and, you know, the whole mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, well, my, the first thing I was going to say, consider leaving. <laughs> um, but then, you know, we talk sometimes about sociocracy by stealth. You know, what are the little things you can do? For example, um, gee, this, this, uh, this policy that we're talking about, you know, implementing, um, I, have some, I have some concerns about that. And um, I'd love to hear what everybody else is thinking about it. Could we do a, a, just go around and hear what everybody's thinking? And you've just introduced a round. Whereas before, it might have just been popcorn and people are silent and they're not going to speak up because, you know, they're, not, they're just not going to for whatever reason. So just introducing the possibility of a round. And it sounds innocent, so why not hear from everybody? So that's something that sometimes can, can be done. Another one that we that we often offer is, you know, the same kind of, oh, I'm not so sure about this, you know, this particular direction that we're heading in. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm sensing that, yeah, we're going to choose to go ahead. Uh, but why don't we plan to take a look in six months and just evaluate, see how well it's going. Um, and so now you've just introduced a term, you know, an, an evaluation, you know, um, so we can look at it and just, again, look at how well is it going? Is it how, you know, how is it not? Um, so those are a couple of those little things that you can do that might start Im influencing the culture. One thing we've had ex uh, good experience with is um, in, in the, the, the context, it only works in a particular context of organization where somebody can say, well, can, you know, you know, can I have a, I'd like to, I'd like to try facilitating this meeting. And then they do it the sociocratic way without saying so without labeling it, because once you label it, a bunch of people go, oh no, sociocracy, I don't like bureaucracies. No, Socio communism, socio socialism, oh no. So if you use the word, sometimes you get resistance right off the bat. But if you just say, I've, I've got some, you know, I'd love to have a chance to try out facilitating this group, I've got some ideas. And you just do it the sociocratic way without labeling it. And people go, wow, that was a really nice meeting. We, you know, we heard from everybody, you know, and so, just by the experience you create the possibility. Um, yeah. Thank you. Where was the other about thing I would say is look for allies, Chloe. Always look for, you know, who are your allies? Who can you talk to? Where can you experiment in a small place? Um, Jeff. 
we are within about a minute of the bottom of the hour and unfortunately i've been empowered <laughs> to single-handedly uh begin and end the meeting uh, but i would like to ask everybody's permission if i could and consent to end the meeting at the bottom of the hour here um without making light of sociocracy. We, we can do the thumbs. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Jerry and Ted, thank you so much. This was really, really good. I, you know, I, I, I'm a, I, I, part of me wishes we could do this again and really attract a larger group and, you know, get out into breakout groups and really practice this, uh, even with your examples. And I realize you picked examples that were really simple, you know, turning on the camera it was illustrative of how this works and that's really 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 useful so um mm -hmm. if well if, now that you've seen it and liked it you can spread the word i would like to do a quick closing round i mean I'd love to hear just a sentence or two from each person um just like what did this mean for you how was this useful or just so that be again the closing round or if you've got suggestions but oh go to chloe then henry um, it's interesting because I felt this was pretty validating in a way because it actually relates to something that has been coming up for me um, around, you know, power and organizational structures um, in a personal situation I have. Um, and so I think it's it's really relevant. And the other thing I thought of is like, I don't think people are bad. I think systems can be bad, like, mm. you know. It seems like systems can, you know, support us as individuals and bring out our best and, and systems can also, you know, mm -hmm. solve all sorts of problems. It's yeah. kind of like what you're talking about. So thank you very much. Okay. Henry and Kathleen. Uh, I appreciate it. I, I uh, just finished reading a book called Crucial Conversations, which has been around for a long time. And uh, uh, in fact, I've got it in my Kindle, so I can come back to it easily enough. Uh, it's a, your your picture is in front of it, of course, uh, and uh, it, so some of what you've talked about reminds me that not only is this a social uh, or a group issue, but it's also uh, a one-on-one -on -one issue uh, to get to where you're trying to hit and uh, mm -hmm. bringing along. Uh, people into that scary kind of idea that you might be reacting to uh, requires some some awesome, some good crucial conversation right. talent right. Uh, to get you there as a group. So thank you. Okay. Kathleen and then Jeff, you can have the last word. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, I am happy to reconnect to this wonderful social uh, technique. Um, um, I wanted to say that objections, I really appreciate objections because I feel they make decisions better. Um, mm -hmm. This is what I wanted to add actually uh, out of experience. And I want to uh, take back my thumb up for Jeff to end the meeting, but rather say I can live with it. I look forward to more. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, close us out, Jeff. Very, very good, Kathleen. Thank you. Uh, this was really helpful for me. It's very clarifying. And as I've told Ted and Jerry, I've bought uh, their the, their book three times and given it away. I'm going to buy it a fourth time and I'm keeping this copy. So uh, uh, I, I want to learn more.